خلاص شو وي ستارت بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Good evening all, my name is Noha Ahmed, I'm a senior dental hygienist and the vice president of the Saudi Dental Hygiene Society. It is a great pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the Saudi Dental Hygiene Society's board members to the first Saudi Dental Hygiene Society International Online Conference. In light, of the current, in light of the current unfortunate pandemic, the Saudi Dental Hygiene Society felt that it has an obligation and effort and put on the effort to fulfill its goals and uh, towards the dental hygiene specialists to provide them with the opportunity for professional growth. In this conference, through a series of online scientific lectures and research presentations, presented by elite national and international speakers accredited by the Saudi Commission of the Health Specialities. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of our presenters and uh, presenting in this conference and to our sponsors of this event. Uh, with no further delay, I will leave you with my colleague, Mr. Abdullah al umari the moderator of the first event. Thank you, Musnoha. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Abdullah al umari I am a senior dental hygienist at Prince Sultan Military Medical City, treasurer and board member of the Saudi Dental Hygiene Society, and also a member of the uh, CMA committee. Before I get to uh, our first speaker, it is important for us to hear back from you about our speakers and the contents of their presentations. So. By the end of each presentation, you are kindly requested to fill out an assessment survey. You will be able to see uh, a red bottom at the middle of the screen. Uh, you just have to click on it and it will take you directly to the survey. Uh, we will have 10 minutes for, for, for the survey by the end of each presentation. Uh, you also are requested to post your questions, if you have any, at the question zone that is uh, located at the lower right corner of your screen. And by the end of each presentation, inshallah, we will get back to your questions. Now, getting back to our schedule, uh, over the next 40 minutes, our speakers will be talking about the evidence-based approach to provide dental hygiene care during and post COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to present to you Ms. Fatoun Khalifa and also Mr. Ayub Topel. Ms. Fatoun Khalifa, is a lecturer and senior dental hygienist at King Saud University Dental Hygiene Department. <clears throat> she holds a master's degree in dental hygiene from Old Dominion University. Currently, she teaches head, neck, and dental, uh, dental anatomy course at King Saud University and works as a clinical and research instructor. Ms. Al Khalifa is a certified item author by the Saudi Commission for Health Specialities. She is a member of the Continuing Education Committee of Saudi Dental Hygiene Society. Mr. Khalifa also, uh, Mr. Khalifa research focus area uh, is dental hygiene curriculum development interrelated to the workforce development. She has participated in a number of national and international conferences as a speaker, as well as organizing dental hygiene scientific events in Saudi Arabia. Following Mr. Khalifa will be Mr. Ayub Tobal. He is a senior dental hygienist with a 20 years of clinical experience that holds an associate bachelor's master's degree uh, in dental hygiene. He also earned his master's in hospital administration from King Abdulaziz University in 2016. He is affiliated with the Ministry of National Guard as a supervisor of dental hygiene services and a member of the Scientific Council for Public, dental, uh, for public Health at the Saudi Commission for Health Specialities. He is a trustee and head of the scientific committee and founding member of the Saudi Dental Hygiene Society. Ladies and gentlemen, with no further ado, here's Ms. Fatoun Khalifa. Thank you, Mr. Abdullah, for your kind uh, introduction. Um, I will go ahead uh, to our topic today. Um, inshallah, in today's presentation, I will give you an overview of a study that's been conducted by the uh, Saudi Dental Hygiene Society. So in this study, we focused on uh, measuring the impact 
knowledge and preparedness of dental hygienists practicing in Saudi Arabia, just to measure their uh, this level to provide care during COVID-19 pandemic. So in this study, we uh, targeted senior dental hygiene students, dental hygiene interns, and uh, dental hygiene practitioners as well. So our main concern for that study is to know where dental hygiene professionals stand in this pandemic to be able to create guidelines and recommendations specific to the dental hygienists in Saudi Arabia. So I will just to, for the sake of time, I will give you an overview of the demographics to be able to understand the dental hygiene workforce better. Then we will move to the impact and the last section, I will talk about the preparedness level. So for the demographics, as we see that the females are dominant, uh, as we know that the hydro profession is dominant by female. However, for the, may, uh, for the number of male hygienists are increasing in the past few years, especially in Saudi Arabia. For the age, the age range from 20 to 50, as we see the highest percentage was from 20 to 30. And we can see a decrease in the percentage moving from 20 to 50 years old. For the nationality of the hygienist, 96.1 uh, were Saudi and only five hygienists were non-Saudi. And for the education, uh, that governmental education is leading in dental hygiene in Saudi Arabia compared to private education. For the level of education, as we know, the entry level for, uh, for dental hygiene practice, even its diploma or its bachelor's, as illustrated here in the level of education, it's 88.5% of Saudi hygienists are bachelor's ho holders, and this is a strength point in the dental hygiene workforce in Saudi Arabia. Unfortunately, when we see the number of bachelor's and master's degrees, it's very low um, compared to the bachelor's holders. Maybe that due to the number of programs um, available for hygienists uh, in Saudi Arabia. Moving to employment, we can see over half of the sample were employed and around 36% 30, uh, were in turn and students, and hopefully this percent would enter the workforce as employed as well. For the region of practice in Saudi Arabia, we can see a high concentration of the hygienists in the middle region with 58.1%, followed by uh, the west, then the south, then the east, and least number of practicing hygienists in the north. And the high concentration of dental hygienists in the middle may be that this due to the employment opportunities as well as the available education programs. Okay, moving to the years of clinical practice. We had a variety of level of uh, clinical experience or clinical practice from less than one year to over 15 years. And this give us a good representation of the dental hygiene workforce for this study. Now I done with the demographics and I'll move to the impact. So one of the first questions that we ask the dental hygienist, are they been put in a situation uh, while they're practicing that could jeopardize their personal safety and well-being? Fortunately and gladly, 69.2% they were not. However, we have 26.2% they practice with the risk to, your, to their safety. What I can see at this point that as, uh, as a practitioner, you have to know your rights and your responsibilities. And according to the Ministry of Health, you have the complete right not to practice if essential PPE is not available for you. And we know how the PPE's uh, availability and quality highly related to the safety of practice, especially during this pandemic. Okay, for the fi financial impact, 66.9% uh, of the hygienists, they didn't get affected financially. However, we have 18.5%, they got affected financially from the pandemic. Okay, for the stress level, unfortunately, the stress level is high. 
in the dental hygienist uh, to practice during this time. So we have 65.6%. They are stressed to practice. Okay, the stress level is highly related to the fear from, from unknown. So how we can manage and reduce the stress level by increasing knowledge and increasing uh, training uh, for dental hygienists and also preparedness. As dental hygienists in Saudi Arabia are practicing, 73.3, they're not practicing. And we have only 22.1 uh, hygienists are practicing right now. So what kind of, um, what kind of care they're delivering? At the top list, they are uh, they are delivering regular uh, clinic care with reduced hours, meaning they are performing aerosolizing procedures, followed by urgent dental hygiene care, and we will know more about this with Mr. Ayub. The third, we have the front line, and we are very proud to be one of the professions who uh, that joined the front line workers, followed by regular practice with the same hours. And interestingly, all student hygienists, they practice through teledentistry, which is remote care. So I think at this point, it's very important to be open and include technology in your practice as well. And the least number, they were practicing with a regular uh, uh, practice, but without aerosol procedures. Okay, now we're done with the impact. I will discuss the preparedness uh, level. So for preparedness level, we have three scales. The first one was fully prepared. That's mean they received all information and all training needed. Adequately prepared. That's mean they received some information and some training. And not prepared. That's mean they completely lack that training and information or knowledge needed. Okay, let's talk about generally. What is the level of preparedness of the hygienists in Saudi Arabia? Generally, they are adequately prepared, meaning they need more information, more knowledge, and more training to practice safely during this time. Okay, so I will focus on fully prepared. So for fully prepared, what was the highest percentage of fully prepared among the hygienists to the list fully prepared. The top of the list, as we can see here, it's the, um, is to provide education to the patient, followed by providing infection control. So I'm going to the most fully prepared to the least fully prepared, followed by handling um, the respirator or N95, followed by dealing with aerosol generating procedures, followed by joining the front line, and the least fully prepared there that was to, tra uh, to treat a confirmed COVID-19 patients. So at this level of, of the study, it's only descriptive. So to be able to make guidelines or recommendations, we need further analysis, and we need also your participation um, to fill another survey to test the um, to test the preparedness and knowledge on different timelines of the dental hygienist. So at this level, what we can conclude, we can conclude that the highest percentage of dental hygienists practicing at this time they are performing aerosol uh, generating procedures. However, they are not fully prepared to practice uh, safely at this time. As well as dental hygienists, they are less prepared to join the front line and as well as to treat a confirmed COVID-19 patient. On the other hand, dental hygienists, they have higher level of preparedness to educate patients and to perform infection control procedures. So this is the end of my section. I will invite you kindly to fill a survey about the same, uh, the same uh, concept about the, uh, um, the impact, preparedness, and, uh, and knowledge. Uh, as this time, we need to test again. Is there, is, there is increase in the knowledge, there is increase in preparedness to be able to give you guidelines and recommendation. Um, now I will pass my, the presentation to Mr. Ayub to continue with you.
Mr. Yu. Mr. Yu. Good evening. Yes. Hello, Anna. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first uh, SDHS uh, International Online Conference. Uh, first of all, um, I would like to uh, thank the organizers and sponsors that made uh, this event happen. I would like also to thank uh, all the attendees for um, attending this presentation and conference. It's really my pleasure and honor to participate. Um, and I hope by the end of this lecture um, that everyone will be uh, prepared for a safe uh, return to practice, whether um, you're a hygienist or a dentist or in any other uh, profession. Okay, I will start by uh, giving you a little bit about my background. My name is Ayub Tubal. Um, I've been in the dental hygiene field for 20 years. Uh, my current job, um, I work as the supervisor uh, of dental hygiene in the National Guard Hospital. I'm the chairman um, of the scientific committee and um, also a member of the Scientific Council on Public Health Saudi Commission. I hold a diploma, bachelor, master degrees in dental hygiene and a master in hospital ad administration. I know that most of you are fed up with information about COVID-19 and um, we've been through it for almost three uh, and, a, and a half months right now. So I'm not gonna repeat uh, myself. So I'm not gonna repeat myself uh, or, or uh, give you any familiar information. Um, through the next 30 minutes, we will go over these objectives. We're going to talk, first of all, about the scientific progress timeline, the job risk of affordable hygienist, why is regular um, uh, PPE not effective. Um, anyhow, um, uh, let's first, um, let me uh, first talk about our profession that um, has, has lasted uh, now for um, 107 years. We celebrated our 100th anniversary in 2013. So uh, we have a good body of knowledge and evidence that we uh, practice on. So um, dental hygienists uh, use scientific evidence in the decision-making process impacting their dental hygiene care. They are responsible and accountable for their dental hygiene practice conduct and decision-making through, of course, the dental hygiene process of care. Um, the evidence-based dental hygiene model um, is the one uh, used right now for clinical decision-making. Uh, the main goal of uh, the dental hygiene practice is to improve and maintain um, the oral health of patients. Um, clinical questions always uh, rise. And right now we are uh, facing a big question. Um, so um, we use the scientific evidence. <clears throat> we use experience and judgment, uh, patient circumstances, and patient preference. This is the hierarchy for the evidence. Um, of course, at the top, we find the clinical guidelines, which is the thing that we're going to talk today about, which is the statement for the uh, Saudi Dental Hygiene Society on COVID-19 and how we developed it through this hierarchy. So we're going to go through the whole statement. We're going to see um, what evidence we uh, took to uh, make our recommendations. 
starting with the scientific progress timeline, um, of course, in December um, 30, the first case was deducted in China. And um, according to the WHO of China office, that they were that they were informed by the government on this date and the source of the infection was um, the sea market and of course there is still a question mark on the uh, etiology of this disease on february 5 here in, in indonesia uh, the scariest market takes bat of menu over virus fear this was February 5. On January 30, uh, the WHO declared, de declared COVID-19 as a public health emergency, still not a pandemic right now. Um, February 18, the first article that was uh, that uh, articulated the COVID-19 in the dental field was this, and we're gonna talk about it. Um, March 11, the WHO declared COVID-19 as a pandemic, and we're still um, in this period. The pandemic has not finished yet, so all the recommendations should um, apply right now. Um, March 12, this Bioneer article was published, um, and, read, and at this time, most dental practices stopped aerosolized uh, procedures. Why? Because of this phrase. Due to the unique characteristics of dental procedures, where a large number of droplets and aerosols could be generated, the standard protective measures in daily clinical work are not effective enough to prevent the spread of COVID-19. So that's why most people stopped and dentists in the dental field stopped uh, these procedures. By March 17 came this uh, surprising, of course, study that changed a lot of uh, things and our understanding about COVID-19, which, uh, which is the, his survival um, um, and the indirect uh, route of transmission. Um, the study, uh, of, of course, I'm sorry, this is in Arabic, but the English form, uh, the English form will be uh, later uh, demonstrated. Um, and it was on, on the news that the workers who face the greatest coronavirus risk are dentists. The WHO announced at this time, because of this study, that it considers the disease airborne. So the whole population just saw this first phrase and uh, they thought it was airborne, but they did not uh, complete even the sentence for medical staff. So it's only airborne wh when it's aerosol aerosolized. Um, then the WHO re released this uh, infographic to uh, correct the facts. So uh, the wrong fact was that COVID-19 is confirmed as an airborne disease. No, the it's not. The virus that causes COVID-19 is mainly transmitted through droplets, generated droplets. And this is the first word I want you to remember. Um, it's through drop droplets, not aerosol. Generated when an infected person cough, sneeze, or speak. These droplets are too heavy to hang in the air they quickly fall, uh, fall on the floor. Okay, let's go th uh, through. Uh, on March 18, uh, following that uh, article for the survival of the virus uh, on services, the WHO released um, its uh, recommendation to postpone all routine and elective procedures and to uh, switch to emergency care. Um, by March, 22, um, the Saudi Dental Hygiene Society released its statement, which we will go through in a while. Um, then uh, the ADHA also released uh, its recommendation, dental practice nationwide postpone um, all elective procedures. The Canadian Dental Hygiene Society also released its recommendation. Okay, let's 
talk uh, about the job risk and why is it important for us as dental hygienists to really learn this uh, information. The OSHA, which is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, um, released its uh, classification uh, for the risk for COVID-19 specifically. Very high, very high is the exposure risk uh, for those who have potential, who have a potential for exposure uh, to known or suspected sources of COVID-19. Okay, let's go to the uh, things that specific for us. Healthcare workers as dentists uh, performing aerosol generating procedures like um, the ultrasonic, of course. So those are at the very high risk, okay? Very high. And remember this word very carefully because most people think it's a high risk. No, the high risk is different than the very high risk because of the aerosol pro, um, uh, producing procedures. And as, uh, if we look here, um, we, we will see it um, specified. So it's when such workers perform uh, aerosol generating procedures that make them at a high, at a very high level. That's the differentiation. Um, okay, the medium risk, the low risk. Then uh, the OSHA um, that, that is uh, under the US Department of Labor, it, it made a study to uh, classify each job, every, all the jobs, okay, on three concepts. Physical proximity, how much are you in physical proximity to people? Exposure to disease, how long per day are you exposed to aerosols and contact with others? These are the three main uh, indicators that were used. And the score was this. Dental hygienists were the highest job for COVID-19. This is an official information. Um, this is the spreadsheet for the uh, distribution of jobs per risk. And if we look at this column, it's by income. How much uh, they receive per year? We will find dental hygienists, of course, having the highest risk. And this is the level of our income. Um, dentists, of course, they are at a very high risk also for uh, COVID-19, the resource for this information is this. Another source that will confirm our information is the Office of National Statistics. Uh, the ONS has created an estimate of exposure to genetic disease and physical proximity for UK. So this is the official uh, body in UK. It released this information confirming that dental hygienists um, are at the very high, have the highest risk uh, between all jobs for COVID-19. That's why it's really important for us. And of course, logically, it will impact us as dental hygienists more than others. So now we're gonna start talking about the impact of dental, uh, the impact of COVID-19 on the dental hygiene profession. Um, hygienists say dentists are putting them at risk for coronavirus. Um, but uh, if we realize the date, this is before the release of the ADA of the uh, postponing of elective surgery uh, and the aerosol uh, generating procedures. So at the beginning, of course, there were a uh, question mark to stop or not. So that was a concern, of course. Um, dental hygienists concerned um, about dentists are still providing non-essential services. This is March 19 also. Then, um, of course, um, here uh, the effect is on, on our clinical practice. It will, infect, it will affect, of course, our income. And if we uh, remember the, from Mrs. Futun that um, we were in um, Saudi Arabia, we were not a lot um, affected financially. And thanks to uh, really our government that uh, provided um, help 
to uh, all private in uh, play, uh, businesses in Saudi Arabia. Okay, let's continue. Dental hygienists are struggling in the Middle East, of course, financially. Here, that's a problem because most pay, most dental hygienists work part time um, in a couple of offices. Their income depends on their uh, number of patients. Um, income evaporates for thousands of Ontarians as coronavirus forces businesses to close. Of course, uh, that's another confirmation of the financial effect. Um, this is in Arabic, of course, I'm going to translate it. This is the, um, the Minister of Finance. Um, he's um, uh, warning everyone that we're going to go through a period of uh, we have to uh, control our spendings. The third dimension that of the impact on the, on dental, on the dental hygiene clinical practice is going back to the practice, of course and having the highest risk for the disease. Hygienists walk a fine line between anxiety, sense of duty as practice begin to open. And if we remember the results from, the, from our study for uh, the Saudi dental hygienists, we will find that about 66% of dental hygienists are anxious and, and worried. Some hygienists express health concerns about going back to work. Dental hygienists are terrified of returning to work. Alberta dental hygienist assisting, assistant raising alarm over opening practices again. And here, realize the date, this is today. Um, uh, yes. Okay, uh, should, I, should, I, uh, should I go back? Try, try to go back and then um, forward Close. again because... Yes. Yeah, and it shows. Okay, now. No, still. Okay. Um, let me start with the other slide. Um, sorry for the delay. Right now, can you see? Is it is it okay now? No, it's still um, lagged. So it's it's showing um, Miss Fatun's uh, the last slide of Miss Fatun. So close the sharing, and then try to open it again. Okay, I'm trying to close the sharing right now. I'm very sorry. Um, Um, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can see it, yes. Is it okay now? Yeah, perfect. Okay, um, now that we have realized the um, impact, the, the three dimensions, uh, first of all, the, of course, the forcing of going to work without the proper PPEs, that's the a big concern. The second concern, the financially. The third concern is going back and uh, to practice safely for uh, ourselves and for um, the patients. So let's examine the dental hygiene, uh, the Saudi Dental Hygiene Society statement on uh, COVID-19, public safety is our, is our main concern. And since it was found that personal protective equipment and measures in daily practice are not effective enough to prevent the spread of COVID-19, especially, okay, um, where did we, and, and this is the purpose of this presentation is 
uh, to explain scientifically every uh, phrase. So um, not effective, are not effective. And that will be our first question. Why is regular PPE not effective? Especially when patients are in the incubation period and they are unaware that they are infected or choose to concern or should to conceal their infection. And also right now, there's a question mark on this. Um, there was a release by the WHO that it really happened and then it was corrected. So um, we still don't know. Okay, let's continue. The Saudi Dental Hygiene Society strongly support the Ministry of Health recommendation to postpone and suspend elective and essential clinical uh, procedures. And remember that we are still in the pandemic period. It hasn't ended yet. So this recommendation and is still uh, effective. And that gives us the second question. How did we, um, what, what did we, um, um, what's our defense for this? Um, such procedure are dental hygiene services. However, in the case that urgent dental hygiene services are needed, so what is urgent dental hygiene care? We encourage all dental hygienists to strictly adhere to the following uh, procedures, and we will go through them all. So um, the rest of our uh, my presentation will be answering those four questions. Why is regular PPE not effective just to stop the spread of COVID-19? And the second one, elective versus emergency treatment. OK, let's continue. So why is regular PPE not effective? These are the four main reasons. <clears throat> um, close proximity, of course, dental hygienists are all the time, all day, all day long, are in close proximity, and it's defined by half a meter or in contact. If you're in the in a half a meter space of the patient, then you're defined as close proximity. And of course, the danger um, right now is um, the aerosols, the, and that's our main um, concern. Um, so, what's the definition for aerosols? It, it's a, an invisible uh, combination of a matrix uh, originating from the treatment site. If we look here, um, this is the treatment site, and this is the uh, tip of the polisher. There are two things. There is this spray that is coming from the polisher, and there is the oral cavity. And of course, the oral cavity is a port for uh, microorganisms, saliva, blood. So when they interact, they produce the aerosols, OK? But we also know that there are, um, we, uh, we know about COVID-19 that it, it's transmitted by droplets. OK, there is another word called spatter. So what's the difference between these words? And that's what we will um, go over right now. And we will clarify. Um, these uh, points. So aerosol is a combination of water from the lines, okay, and air. It is in contact with the oral cavity, and then it's, it, uh, it contains the plaque, calculus, blood, and saliva. And it was found that uh, a fourfold, a fourfold increase in airborne bacteria uh, has been observed um, when aerosol procedures are used. The other um, uh, word spatter, what's the difference? Aerosols are fine particles that are less than 50 uh, microns, whereas spatter is more than 50 microns. Okay, where, uh, what is droplets? Droplets is the same as spatter, okay? So spatter is like a lot of things, a, a lot of droplets. Um, aerosols also are classified into fine and ultra fine, okay? Um, the, the fine is from 2.5 to 10 microns. The ultra fine is less than 
2.5. And let's talk a little bit about COVID-19 virus. It, um, the size of it is less than one, uh, 0.1, okay? So it's very small. So it's defined as ultra fine. Why are these sizes important? Um, in this study, they found that the inhalation size for particles um, uh, less than five microns will be uh, inhaled by the person. So uh, the nose will not be able to uh, filter the, the aerosol coming to the person. How is COVID-19 transmitted? Okay, if you remember uh, aerosols, aerosols are less than aerosols are less than 50. We said, okay, that's right. Here they mean aerosols that could be in the air. Okay, in uh, if it's less than 10, then it could flow and it could be uh, suspended in the air. Um, let's look here from. Uh, let's look at this. Uh, the cough. This is the velocity. Uh, it's 10, um, uh, it's 10 per um, minute per second. And the distance that it can travel is two meter. The sneeze is very strong. It travels up to six meters. So um, if you have a, a mask and you are on two meters, you can still catch um, the aerosols. The process um, that we produce aerosols is called aerosolization. And the de definition of um, aerosolization is the mechanized air suspension of liquids, solids, and microorganisms to produce aerosols. Okay, we, we just saw that um, humans also can make uh, aerosols and here, we can see that aerosolization is mechanized, so by machines, not by humans, okay? And let's di di differentiate a little bit. So here, the production of aerosols is called atomization, all right? And the definition of atomization is the natural production of aerosols and droplets by humans, either by sneezing, coughing, or during talking or breathing by an infected person. So the microorganisms will um, leave the port of uh, the mouth and the other person will be affected. And this is the resource for the atomization, human atomization of viruses. So the, uh, the production of aerosols in humans, it's called atomization. But if a machine produces aerosols, it's called aerosolization that's the main point okay um what makes this virus uh, very dang very dangerous and of course we've heard in the news that um it's very dangerous but why that article that um uh, confirmed that it could uh, be transmitted uh, and could, could stay alive on services for a lot of time um, here this study confirmed that the highest viral load of COVID-19 is in the sputum and upper airway sputum is saliva so the concentration of COVID-19 in the saliva is the highest so it has a big load there's a lot of uh, Vi uh, viruses in the oral cavity. So anytime a person talks, sneeze, or um, uh, or cough, he, he 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 will release a lot of viruses. That's the problem with aerosol. And of course, if we practice and generate, yes. Yeah, I hate to interrupt, but your skin seems to be disappeared. So if you could please. Uh, 
share it again. Uh, again. Sorry about um, I should do it again? Yes. We don't see it anymore. Try you. Yes, now, can you see my screen? Not yet, unfortunately. Yes, now. Okay, perfect, go back. Okay, so now? Can see it now, yeah, yes. Okay. yes. Sorry okay. about that. Let, let's go back to this very important point, is that the viral load in the, in the saliva is very high. So anytime we use the aerosol proce um, generating procedures, you, it's like you're uh, shooting a lot of uh, viruses in there. Um, what's special about this disease and the mutation from the previous uh, coronavirus is that yeah, is these uh, parts that he has, and when it comes in contact with the human cell, um, it targets the uh, receptors that have ACE2 uh, proteins. And most cells in the human body contain uh, have this protein, so it's very easy for him um, to attach to the uh, receptor and release its DNA to the uh, cell and start producing more viruses uh, from inside the cell. And that's the very uh, 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 and that's the most important point that makes this uh, virus dangerous. Um, of course, this study, um, how did they confirm that the uh, oral cavity has the highest viral load of the uh, virus? They found that the virus could um, bind to the salivary glands, not to the saliva or anything, no, to the glands themselves. And then the glands will be infected and all the saliva it releases will, be, will contain viruses. And that's very uh, dangerous. Okay, um, we said that the inhalation size for uh, particles in humans is less than five. And the COVID-19 virus is less than one. So um, it will enter the nose and then uh, move to the lung. It will enter the lung and its small size allow it to go inside the alveola, okay? If it's inside the alveola, um, this is the blood. Um, let me get the pointer just a minute. Okay, here. This is the alveola. And then if the virus enters the uh, alveola, um, the white blood cells here start to come and start to attack this alveola creating inflammation in that alveolar. And don't and, and remember that there is a big uh, or, or there's a high uh, load of the virus and it um, uh, and it can produce uh, a lot of viruses. That capability makes it very dangerous. So um, in, in a healthy person, uh, the white blood cells, will um, attack this virus and will control the disease. He will have minor coughing or uh, minor symptoms, but in uh, medically compromised patients, um, they will, the white blood cells will not be able to fight the virus and it will start um, uh, through the blood going to other parts of the body like the brain. And this is an article uh, confirming the association of the hem uh, acute hemorrhagic necrotizing uh, encephalitis uh, CT. So what this means is that um, the virus uh, bind to a brain cell that has the ACE2 uh, uh, receptor and inflammation happened and uh, there was bleeding. So now um, most of the uh, drugs that uh, uh, those patients are using um, contain uh, anticoagulants or sorry coagulants to stop the hemorrhage okay moving to uh, the other reason for why regular PPE is not effective of course we said close proximity then we talked a little bit about aerosols and uh, spatter and about the unique characteristic of this disease 
and the concentration of uh, of this disease in the oral cavity it's the highest okay now the aerosol generating procedure uh, in this study that was published in 2004 um, they examined the aerosolization efficiency of these uh, procedures and they found that ultrasonic and sonic scalers are considered the greatest source of aerosols contamination okay so that's why hygienists are at the highest risk and ultrasonics should not be used without the proper PPE, although that the use of high vacuum evacuator will reduce the airborne contamination. So it's recommended to use high volume evacuator with ultrasonics on regular uh, times, not now. So now it's uh, more and we're gonna have to take more precautions. But I want you to remember that it's recommended. This is a recommendation to use it <clears throat> whenever you use an ultrasound. Um, the uh, um, air polishing followed uh, ultrasonic in the efficiency of aerosolization, then water, uh, the air water syringe, then the tooth preparation with turban handpiece, then tooth preparation with uh, air abrasion. And this was the sequence for how much they produce air. Okay, this is the guideline from the Ministry of Health <clears throat> uh, differentiating uh, between aerosol generating and non aerosol generating. And we will find here some dental procedures, high speed drilling, and of course, ultrasonics. It's considered uh, aerosol generating procedure. And in Arabic, they call it Baitha Lil Haba Al Ajawi. That's the word for aer aerosolization. And aerosols are called al haba al Okay, there is no single approach or device that can minimize the risk of infection to dental uh, personnel and other patients completely. So what's the secret to open and what we should, should we do to return to our regular practice? It's PPE. PPE, not regular PPE modified or uh, airborne uh, PPEs. Personal protective equipment, and this is a coherent review. And we find here that it says, personal protective equipment offers a way of reducing the risk of infection when treating patients by minimizing exposure to contaminated body fluid. And this is of course specified for uh, in the dental field. So this is the solution to go back to our work. And of course, we're gonna explain later what are the special uh, PPEs that we're gonna use. Uh, going back to the third reason why PPEs are not effective is that aerosols could penetrate the surgical mask. Okay, our regular mask, um, and we will look here about, uh, we will understand the difference between a, a surgical or uh, an N95. Okay, testing, both of them are approved, of course. Uh, intended use, why are they used? They are, they, um, the surgical mask is for large, against large droplets, splashes, but it does not prevent against small uh, particles or aerosol. The N95 reduces wearer exposure to particles, including small particle, small particle aerosols and large droplets. So this is the intended use. Okay, the seal, um, this uh, of course is loose and that's why aerosol could uh, penetrate uh, a surgical mask if they are 30 microns in size or less. Testing, um, okay, um, let's look here, filtration. It does not provide the wearer with a reliable level of protection from inhaling small airborne particles. Okay, this is uh, very clear from the CDC that it says it does not prevent uh, aerosol, um, uh, it does not prevent aerosol from, um, from getting infected. Uh, leakage, uh, leakage occur, uh, occurs around the edges of the mask when the user inhales. Uh, when properly and don't, uh, 
uh, minimal leakage occurs. So it's a 95, and there's a 5% that it could, uh, uh, an aerosol could leak the mask. And these are the studies that um, supported the, uh, the recommendations for the N95 use. Here they yes. Jump to the conclusion, we have passed 55 minutes. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna go uh, very fast now. Just uh, try to finish up, please. Thank you. These are the studies that confirmed um, uh, the use for N95, and here we can find it uh, also the CDC, and then it's in the guidelines that the N95 uh, provide low level uh, of risk, so it should be used here uh, moderate level. There is the, there could be leakage. Okay, the first, the fourth uh, point is survival of COVID-19, and uh, these are the. Uh, this is the study that uh, came uh, with this uh, recommendations, and don't forget it could stay in the air for three hours. Okay, the second question: uh, elective per uh, versus emergency, and um, uh, of course we don't have time to go uh, through all of them, but we're gonna uh, speed up. Here, uh, the recommendation from the Ministry of Health. And of course, I'd like to remind you that there will be a recording for all these uh, presentations on the uh, Saudi Dental Hygiene Society uh, YouTube channel later. So uh, you're gonna, if you wanna go back to my presentation, you will find it, or any presentation. Um, the Saudi uh, Society uh, also released their uh, recommendation and how, uh, and the time for waiting per procedure, how much it could wait, and so, of course, the priority. Um, the third question, what is urgent dental hygiene care? And how could hygienists participate in this emergency care? Is care towards patients who have medical conditions that necessitates dental hygiene care or immediate attention to relieve pain? And um, the first one, medical conditions that necessitate dental hygiene like cancer clearance patient, transplant clearance patient, and cardiac clearance patient. Okay, the second part, uh, or need immediate attention to relieve pain, like uh, uh, periodontal inflammation causing pain, such as pericoronitis, periodontal abscesses, and gingival overgrowth. And from the uh, College of Registered Dental Hygienists of Alberta, um, I uh, we find, um, here, uh, effective May 4, um, provide, uh, everyone should provide emergency only. And if appropriate PPE is not available, all health services must be not performed. And they define what's urgent dental hygiene care, which I just um, explained. Okay, um, of course, we don't, we don't have time. Um, I'm gonna go through my presentation. Um, to the important things. Uh, here, uh, most protocols did not include this, but um, according to this study, they found that a lot of uh, contamination is happening by the floor because everyone forgets to clean them. And of course here, uh, confirming this uh, recommendation. Okay, using particular uh, N95, we just talked about it, but Let's talk a little bit about reusing the N95. This topic was raised also. And um, the OSHA provided guidelines for reusing, but and also the CDC. But um, if you look at the manufacturer uh, instructions, you will find it says it's for single use. So there's a question mark here. But if you go through our recommendation, you will find that you should discard the N95 respirator following the use uh, of aerosol generating procedure. So they say it. it's included that it should be discarded if you're using aerosol, or also discard uh, the N95 contaminated with blood, of course, and uh, uh, body fluid. Uh, universal masking. Um, the second thing is uh, using high volume saliva ejector. Of course, as we just saw in a while, it's recommended. 
The other thing is the external vacuum aerosol uh, uh, machine that's new. And also it has a big question mark. Okay, why the question mark? Um, here, uh, although there, is, there are some machines that are FDA approved, um, the thing is, okay, it, uh, most of these machines have the HIPAA uh, filters, but what happens after uh, all my microorganisms are collected? That's the important uh, point about these machines. So this machine that is FDA approved, it has ultraviolet uh, sterilization with high effective uh, efficient uh, and match medical standards to kill all uh, bacteria. But still, uh, there, there are studies also confirming their effectiveness. But let's look here and wait a little bit. Much remains unknown about managing dental aerosols. The American Dental Association is warning, and this is a warning, dental providers about purchasing uh, products designed to uh, disinfect or eliminate dental aerosols, such as air filters and ultraviolet lights. Okay, so it's a warning. Why? Uh, because we still don't know, and there is no good evidence or strong evidence to support it. This is the ADA recommendation. Products market to sanitize, uh, reduce dental aerosols, may lack like, may like research. Um, of course, th this is the recommendation for using hydrogen peroxide, and that is effective for killing uh, microorganisms. And this, of course, this is the PPE, the modified PPE for using aerosol uh, generating procedures. Let's remember that. And here we will see the Ministry of Health also in their recommendations confirming the use of mouth rinses containing oxidative agent and also the hydrogen peroxide. Okay, the um, using the ultrasonics should be, of course, limited at this time. Um, what about hand scaling? Should we use an N95 during hands, um, ninth, uh, during hand scaling or not? We will see here from the uh, Canadian uh, uh, British Columbia mm -hmm. uh, Hygiene Association, is hand scaling as a, gener a non-generating uh, aerosol machine. Uh, what is it recommended? Okay, high hand scaling is not considered to be equivalent aerosol uh, producing uh, capacity. So a surgical mask is okay to be used with uh, hand scaling. It doesn't produce aerosols. Um, going to our last point, if there is a patient um, with COVID-19 or suspected, and you use aerosol, uh, you, you should wait for a, um, a period of time. And this is the Ministry of Health recommendation. Um, what are the recommendations for a negative pressure room? It's like dental procedures. Um, and if you look at this, at this table uh, for the rooms, this is for, for the room. Okay, um, thank you all for uh, listening and th I'm sorry for uh, taking that long. I hope everyone is uh, prepared for going for, for practice. Thank you very all for listening. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Mr. Kuhn, for the great presentation. I just would like, I, I'm afraid we have no time for questions this time. Uh, I just would like to present to you uh, this certificate of appreciation for your effort and contribution during this session. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ayoub and uh, uh, Mr. Bon Khalifa. The certificate should appear on the screen right now. I'm trying to do it. Okay, this is for Mr. Ayoub and also. Uh, now it's time to move on to our next uh, speaker. We are 